it is my very great pleasure and privilege to introduce Rada Bournier, the international president of the Theosophical Society, headquartered in Adyar, Madras, India. The Theosophical Society formed in, seven, in, in <laughs> whoops, 1875 uh, in New York City has three principal objects. To form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. To encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science. And to investigate unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in man. Rada Bournier is a woman of many talents. Some of us know her from her performance in the film directed by Jean Renoir, The River. We are happy that she did not stay in films, <laughs> but came back to theosophical work. She is a third generation theosophist, the author of a number of books no Other Path to God, The Way to Self-Knowledge, Truth, Beauty, and Goodness, and Human Regeneration. She is an international speaker, and it is our privilege this afternoon to hear her talk to us on self-transformation and the future of religion. Rada Bournier. Friends, one may wonder whether if human beings had the power to be completely happy and harmonious, they would want religion at all. In the context of this parliament of the world's religions, we should ask, what is the function of a religion? What in fact it is? Is the human being asking for something of a religion and is religion giving the right answers? Perhaps, as suggested, if human beings were enjoyed the capacity to be deeply happy, at harmony with all the world, they wouldn't want religion. And we see that this capacity is not in the human being. Human, humanity has been in an unhappy condition, in pain and anxiety for ages. And it is asking for relief from that unhappiness, from its fears and anxieties. And has a religion provided the answer? Human beings also are searching for meaning. Meaning of the processes around them, the process of birth and death, of growth and diminishing 
and they want to understand what all this means. What is life about? Is there something beyond these processes? Something more meaningful than what we are able to sense and know at present? And is each person wants to know what is the meaning of his or her own life in the perspective of the vaster life? Is it like a bubble which appears for a time and has no existence a moment after? So, on the one hand, the human mind feels the necessity to look at the universe, at life, and find out its meaning, its beauty, its uncover its mystery, and on the other hand, to be free of its own sorrow and suffering. And it's not, a, it's not the function of religion to remove or help to remove human unhappiness and to make humanity aware of what is the mystery of life. Not just more facts and information about the phenomena, the processes, but the significance of those phenomena, the beauty concealed in those processes. But religion, as we know it, has hardly fulfilled this function. As we said, human suffering has gone on for ages. And that suffering is not only physical suffering caused by natural uh, happenings, cataclysms of some kind, the hurricane or whatever it is, the flood. Physical suffering, of course, exists, but there is the much larger suffering which we find in human society, which is fear, the suffering caused by exploitation, wars and conflicts, which generate hatred, suspicion of each other, loneliness, not knowing in which direction to proceed. Manifold is the suffering of the human being. And we have been trying to find many different ways of getting over that suffering. Perhaps what we call religion is one of those ways, but actually religion has added to that suffering to a great extent. Religion has been the source of many evils. It has encouraged people to divide themselves. My religion, your religion. Your God is not my God. It has generated conflict. Although today the modern world may be called the scientific world, still the harm caused by religion is quite considerable. Wars have been 
started in the name of religions, persecutions have taken place, and very unfortunate customs have come into existence in connection with every religion. People have been brainwashed into being cruel to each other. I think it is unnecessary to describe all this. It's a known thing. The, in the name of religion, innumerable evil acts have been committed. And people have been made to suffer a great deal. So instead of relieving the human being of suffering, religion has often, or much of the time, added to that suffering. We have only to look at the past, at the story of the persecutions, the inquisition, the efforts to convert other people, the use of the carrot and stick to make people afraid, afraid of eternal damnation, afraid of so what the priests may say, forcing them into obedience and conformity because of this fear. Encourage them not to think. This has all been part of the story of religion. And instead of helping human beings to understand life, which also humanity has been asking for, Religions have generally, not entirely, but generally, been providing ready-made ideas. <laughs> Belief. This is the truth and your duty is to believe what you are told, whether it is about heaven or God or relationship or what you should do from morning till night, what rituals you shall perform, whether you should stand or kneel, everything is given in the form of instruction. And belief and obedience of this kind is the antithesis of intelligence and understanding. How can we understand life if we merely accept what we are told. Therefore, religion has to a large extent failed. Yet, it is important because as long as human suffering continues, we need an answer. And as long as we are in contact with this marvelous world of nature, with its diversities, with all its wonders, we have to question what it is, what is the origin of it, whether our lives are in accordance with nature or not, what is death, what is birth, and so on. So, religion in that sense of something which will answer man's inquiries is important. But because it has not taken the trouble to answer, but has sought rather power over the minds of human beings, it has become trivial and has lost energy. Every time a new person with vision with spiritual 
awareness spoke, a little energy was put into the religious field, but very soon it deteriorated. To quote J. Krishnamurti, one of the most significant speakers on the subject in recent times, creative energy is necessary for a religion. Because religion transforms social order. Every culture is born anew out of a new religion, not in the repetition of dead traditions. And energy can come when you have understood the quality of seeing and listening, when you can look at facts, look at your jealousy, your ambition, your passions, and all the absurdities you have built around yourself, out of this confrontation comes that energy which brings mutation. And that is what transformation is about. Now, if we we'll take the trouble to see and listen, as he suggests, at the world outside, which is so full of suffering. And we also observe our own minds at work. Perhaps we will realize that the problems of humanity, its suffering, are really the problems within the human mind. The mind is the cause of everything that happens outside. War and conflict, killing, violence, it's all around us. But that is because violence, ill will, hatred, are within us, each one of us, perhaps not in an aggressive form, in small ways, but every drop makes the ocean. Each one of us is adding to the kind of thought which exists around the world. And unfortunately, not only religion, but society around us pressurizes us to think as others do, to conform to the pattern of thinking everywhere around us. So, we take it for granted that a certain amount of ill will, suspicion of others is legitimate. And so we add to the total may I call it the psychic atmosphere of the world, the thought pattern in the world. If we are patterned after the world, there cannot be a new mind, as we have been told. So, that pattern has to be broken. So, everything in the world we can find in ourselves. Is there, why is there so much poverty? side by side with great affluence. As someone mentioned the other day, it's not only that the world is divided into the affluent countries and the poor ones, but in every country there are the extremely wealthy and the very poor. There are the downtrodden and the privileged. We know that if a poor man in shabby clothes goes to a court of law, he doesn't have the same chance as a well-dressed person. Why is there this injustice? Because in our minds we nourish inequality. We have created a scale of values which is false. And it has grown into us. We are conditioned into it from early childhood. We are taught whom to respect and whom to despise who is wealthy and who is poor, 
who is socially higher up and who is not. We are nourished on this and therefore we cannot but create a society in which there is injustice. So it's our own prejudices, our sense of inequality, our desire to acquire things which create a society around us. We have a terribly competitive, stressful society around. It is because we have produced that society out of what is in our own minds. We are so anxious to acquire. Now, if we look at ourselves, we will see various elements which, of which this society outside is a magnified reflection. We can take some examples. The insecurity every person almost feels inside. And that is why we are so very anxious to acquire labels. We want to call ourselves Hindu or Muslim, Christian or Prince or whatever it is. We want to belong to something, to a family, to a nation, to a religious group. We want to identify with something or other because we are afraid that if we are not identified with the family or the nation or a community or a religion, belong to some group or category that we will be lost in this wide world. It's this feeling of insecurity which prevents us from inquiring whether in fact we are making ourselves secure by it. We have only to look outside to see, again to mention Krishnamurti, as he said, by this terrible anxiety to become secure, we are creating an extraordinarily insecure world. Everybody out to get something for himself, belong to a group which will do better than some other group. So we are creating a world of great insecurity. And it is this insecurity which makes us cling to ideas and opinions. We do not like opinions which are different from others, uh, from ours. We do not like uh, any new concept. This is generally, with exceptions, the condition of human beings. So we want to oppose our ideas to uh, those of others instead of listening, finding out whether there is some truth in the other person's ideas. Because even in a foolish person's concepts, there may be a grain of truth. And if the mind were open, we could listen to that sometimes. A wise person has been called the wise fool. <clears throat> but the mind is not generally open. It sticks to its own perceptions. Therefore, it doesn't want to inquire into anything. And it's ready to accept, to be conditioned. And because of this, Conflict has become so widespread because we are so attached to our nationality, our religion, our opinions, our family, our possessions. We want to make ourselves secure and each of these groups is at war with the others. And therefore the world is terribly divided. But it is we who are creating that conflict. And all of us who are 
clinging to some particular thing, mentally putting labels on ourselves, we are creating the conflict outside, we are participating in it, but we are unaware of it. The statement was made when the United Nations was established, war begins in the minds of men. And everybody says, yes, yes, but we don't look into our own minds to see that this is so. And what are the subtle as well as the obvious causes within ourselves? Because after all, each one of us can only reform ourselves. Let us look at another aspect of the human mind. That is our own minds, my mind, the mind of the human being in general. It suffers from a feeling of emptiness, not knowing where it is going, not knowing what life is about. And because it is empty and does not want to face it, look at it, it wants distraction, it wants enjoyments, pleasures, anything which will make it escape from itself. So, we have created a society around us which is enormously pleasure-oriented. And uh, the technology has not helped. Technology is producing so many objects, novelties, fashions, so that one can go searching for more and more things outside. So, we have a consumerist, pleasure-seeking society which breeds competition and tension and inevitably cruelty. Because when everybody is competing, we naturally are cruel. So, we live in this kind of society. And what does a religion need to do if it's really to survive as an energetic force for the redemption of man? It has to restore the art of self-understanding, which means self-awareness. In this modern society, we have been all the time looking outside, outside to understand the facts of the universe. And as we said, technology has produced so many distractions outside. We are not to blame technology, but only ourselves, that we want these distractions. And so there is also society, all the people around us, our parents, teachers, friends, everybody, who tell us that we must fall into the pattern we must also go be go-getters. We must also establish our own identity, fight for it. And so we proceed on that way and we become less and less accustomed to looking within. So religion has to help humanity first of all to observe and discover where the source of its problems is, that is, within the mind. Can security be obtained by going outside? Obviously not. We have just touched upon it, but in the time given, we cannot really discuss it in detail. Can the meaning of life be discovered if all the time we are engaged in struggling and striving, when we are never quiet? And perhaps that meaning is in what some scientists at least are now talking about, 
about the wholeness of life, its interconnectedness. From the theosophical point of view, religion is the discovery of the unity of existence. Religion is a bond which unites not only all people together, but all beings and all things in the entire universe into one grand whole. I am paraphrasing from the words of Madame Blavatsky, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society. And it may be by discovering this interconnectedness and still deeper this unity that the meaning of life can be found. But can we discover it if we are in a state of internal turmoil, searching here and there? We cannot obviously understand anything, realize even what facts are, as long as this struggle goes on inside. There is anxiety, fear and so on, which are all expressions of what we call the Self. The Self is the greatest obscuration that the mind can have. It's obvious that any expression of the Self, pride for example, arrogance, makes a person see things as they are not. Unless one becomes free of that pride, then one cannot really see. And the same is true of anger, of jealousy, of envy, of so many things. All the passions that the religions have spoken of, but very few try to look at for themselves in, within their own minds. These have to be eliminated. To free the heart of these obscuring factors, it's not enough to hear the words of others, because if we are merely hearing other people's words, we never feel convinced. Unless we see that it obscures our, this obscure our own perception. And unless we see that by entertaining them, we are creating the suffering around ourselves. We do not start doing anything about them. So, learning to become inwardly free means that we have to start observing ourselves. Self-observation leading to self-understanding, self-knowledge is the first step in transformation. And if we look at this in the light of religion, is it not the most important thing that has to happen for the good of humanity? and of all living creatures, because if the human being learns not to be harsh, not to be hard, because he is in competition, because he is insecure, then perhaps other creatures also will not suffer so much. We are committing dreadful cruelty on animals, on all other living beings in the present day. And this is what humanity needs, not theologies. Why not leave God, theology, the forms of worship, the customs and so on to the individuals? Let every individual decide whether he wants to go to a place of worship constructed in, according to some particular design or another. 
whether it is called mosque or church or temple, let him choose what he wants to go to. Let him decide what form of prayer he wishes to adopt. But maybe the emphasis can be the change which needs to take place in the mind. And if that is so, then religion may help to free the human being of suffering instead of adding to the suffering. And then religion would have a real future. Otherwise it will have a future which is again a painful one, adding to the problems of mankind. And today the world cannot afford to be divided, to be full of problems because of technology. We could afford to make war, kill some thousands of people in the past ages, but not today. Today we will extinguish ourselves. We could afford to be greedy because we didn't have the means to be so greedy. But today we are disturbing our own habitat, habitat to a dangerous extent. We could perhaps in the old days afford to misuse our knowledge, to brainwash people to a little extent. But with the power given to us now by the media of communication, we cannot afford to misuse the, uh, these facilities. So the world today is very different. And therefore, religion, if it is to have a future, must help to change the direction of human progress. It must be progress which transform the individual from his state of ignorance about himself and his relation to society into a state of understanding and self-knowledge. It must help the humanity in general to realize that to work for self is really to work for disappointment, particularly in this interconnected world. To each one seeking security means much greater insecurity. Each one trying to fulfill his greediness means stress and competitive horrors for everybody. So, religion must help to bring about this transformation. And if we can become free of our sense of insecurity, not try to find an answer to it by things outside, but by understanding it. If we can learn that happiness, fulfillment cannot come by everlastingly searching for pleasure outside, we have to look within, then perhaps we will discover something within which gives all, all the answers which we need. I'd like to quote, finally, two statements by, made by very well-known theosophists. One is, again, by Madame Blavatsky, who says, no wisdom from above descends on anyone save on condition of leaving every atom of selfishness or desire for personal ends and benefits. 
nature gives up her innermost secrets and imparts true wisdom only to him who seeks truth for its own sakes and who craves for knowledge in order to confer benefits on others, not on his own unimportant personality. So nature does not give up her secrets to the person engaged in self-promotion, in seeking his own security. If all that comes to an end through our understanding of what we are doing, perhaps then there will be immense discoveries to be made about the nature of the universe. Not merely as we, the facts, knowledge about the phenomena as we say, but about the beauty, the order, the harmony, all of which are in life. We may be endowed with life's own intelligence, but to come to that first we have to free ourselves of our self-concern and that is what religion must do if it is to have a future. Dr. Annie Besant, who spoke at the Parliament of World Religions in 1893, gave two magnificent lectures, spoke these words, that which can never come by argument, by controversy, by intellectual reasoning, will come when the heart of love within us has awakened the spiritual nature. There cannot be love along with self-seeking. There cannot be love along with self-concern. So the heart has to be cleansed of that self-concern and then it can awaken to love, which is the transformation that we are speaking about. And again to quote her, love is deeper than intellect, love is greater than intelligence, and the love nature and the divine nature are so closely blended that it will not be long ere the man who loves his brother loves God. There is much talk about God, but we do not know what God is. How can anybody know what is God when his mind and heart are filled with his own petty little self? It's only when the self is purified by its image of itself, its concern for itself, and it is pure the mind is pure, it is open, that it can know love. And perhaps that love itself is God. No other God may be needed. To know life in all its beauty, its order, its intelligence, may itself be the discovery of God.